Hi everyone and welcome to today's broadcast. This webinar is being brought to you by the Clean Energy States Alliance and the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as STAP. Our topic today is Flow Battery Basics. This is the second part of our webinar series. Um, and to begin with, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. All of our participants today will be in listen-only mode. This means that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. You uh, can connect to the audio portion of the webinar using your computer, mic, and speakers, or using a headset. Uh, or you can listen in via telephone. We would suggest that you listen in using your computer to avoid telephone charges. But if you are listening to us today by phone, we ask that you please enter the audio pin into your telephone keypad. And today, uh, an important thing to note is that we're encouraging all of our participants to enter their questions as you think of them into the question box on your webinar console. Um, th uh, enter your questions as you think of them anytime, and we'll cube your questions for a Q&A at the end with all of our guest speakers. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. You'll be able to find a recording of this webinar and all of CESA's previous webinars archived on our website at the address on your screen. And with that, I would like to introduce Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is the project director for STAP, and he's going to introduce today's guest speakers and talk a little bit about our project. Todd, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to welcome everybody to the webinar. This is our second in a series on flow batteries, and I uh, want to mention that uh, we do have all our webinars archived on our site. If you missed the first in the series and you'd like to go back and review that, uh, you, can, you can do so on our website and we'll have that URL uh, shown later in the program. Go ahead and advance the slides, please, Samantha. Uh, so before uh, proceeding, I'd like to thank our uh, sponsor from uh, U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Electricity, Dr. Imri Zhuk, who we are fortunate enough to have here to uh, introduce the topic today, and also uh, Dan Borneo from Sandia National Laboratories, who's also with us, uh, won't be doing a presentation, but hopefully will be contributing to the questions and, and discussion session. Next slide, please. I wanted to uh, introduce STAP for those of you who aren't familiar. Uh, STAP is a project of CESA, which is the Clean Energy States Alliance. We're a nonprofit. We work with states all over the country to help them implement their clean energy policies and programs. In this case, uh, specifically on energy storage, uh, we work through our energy storage program, STAP, which stands for Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership which we are uh, fortunate enough to have uh, funding for from USDOE, and we do this under contract with Sandia. Uh, primarily, we are uh, engaged in two key activities. We disseminate information to stakeholders through programs such as this, and we also uh, conduct webinars, conferences, and, and so forth. And secondly, we facilitate public-private partnerships at the state level uh, for energy storage uh, project development and deployment. And so in that regard, we basically uh, t attempt to bring states and municipalities to the table to work with U.S. DOE and Sandia uh, in deploying energy storage projects around the country. And you can see there's a map showing some of our current uh, state partners and, and some details of that. Next slide, please. If you would like to be notified of future webinars and other events, please sign up on our listserv. This is a screen capture from our website. There's a red circle around the green button right there in the middle where you can click to be added to the listserv. <clears throat> and on the left, there's a red arrow indicating location of the link to get to our webinar archives if you'd like to review this or prior webinars. And we have webinars now going back for two years or more at that archive. Next slide, please. So I'd like to introduce our guest speakers today. We have uh, Dr. Emery Zhuk of the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Electricity. Dr. Zhuk joined DOE to manage the thermal and physical storage program. 
For the past decade, he's directed the Electrical Energy Storage Research Program in the Office of Electricity. He also supervises the $185 million ARRA stimulus funding for grid-scale energy storage demonstrations. He holds a PhD in physics and is an internationally recognized expert on storage technologies. I'd also like to welcome Dan Borneo of the Distributed Energy Electrical Energy Storage Program at Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, Mr. Borneo is a senior electrical engineer at Sandia. He works with industry in bringing innovative electrical energy storage technologies to commercialization. Uh, his prior work was in building and maintaining electrical infrastructure in the semiconductor industry. He's been involved in the electrical industry for 30 years and holds a uh, BSEE and MSEE from the University of New Mexico. Now, their main presentations today will be from uh, Primus Power and Raytheon. From Primus, we have Andrew Marshall. He's the Director of Utility Solutions with Primus and is responsible for business and customer development and product strategy for the utili uh, company's utility business. Prior to joining Primus, he was a consultant with McKinsey and Company in Silicon Valley, where he served energy, basic materials, and high-tech companies on technology and product strategy and operations. He holds a PhD in chemistry. And we will have from Raytheon two people on, on the uh, webinar, Sherry Nevins, the department manager, and Tracy Montoya, who is Raytheon's K Raytheon KTEC's lead engineer for energy storage. The presentation will be made by Tracy, who has over 20 years of experience in systems engineering and controls, including analog and digital design and development. She's led the design and build of Raytheon's ES products, as well as supporting Sandia National Labs in their independent testing of these products, and she'll be speaking on Raytheon systems using red flow batteries. So I think that uh, takes care of the introductions. Next slide, please. Before we begin with an introduction by Dr. Zhuk, I would like to again ask that you uh, participants in the webinars type your comments in as they occur to you so that when we get to the end of the presentations, we can have a good list of comments queued up and ready to go. And um, I always get questions about uh, reviewing these. The answer is yes, they are. The, the webinar will be archived and available for review at a later date. Okay, so I think without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Zhuk to give us a introduction on flow batteries for bulk energy storage. Well, hello, I'm uh, Imre Zhuk. I'm the program manager for energy storage research at the Department of Energy. And uh, we are very happy to have the ISTAP program uh, provide these more or less regular uh, webinars to uh, present information on energy storage uh, to the states, but actually to anyone who happens to be interested. Uh, this is the second uh, webinar on the topic of flow batteries. So for a quick reprise, uh, the characteristic things for flow batteries is that they decouple power from energy. The power is produced by a rechargeable electrochemical cell that's in the middle, and energy is stored in tanks of electrolyte. The thing is, if you want more energy, you just have more electrolyte, more tanks. If you want more power, uh, you have more of these uh, fuel cells in the middle. And this is very analogous to a car where the power comes from the engine, but the energy is in the gasoline tank. Now, remember flow batteries are primarily energy batteries. They generally hold enough energy for three to four hours of discharge. This is different to other batteries, which are basically power batteries, and uh, where the importance is in the power rather than the energy. And because they can uh, hold energy, uh, uh, because they can hold appreciable amounts of energy, they are particularly suitable for peak shaving, uh, but also appropriate for ramping and resiliency applications. 
Uh, both Primus and Redflow utilize zinc bromine chemistry. Uh, this is a this creates a flow battery, but not a uh, redox battery as such. Advantages of zinc bromine is first of all that the electrochemical potential is relatively large, uh, more than vanadium vanadium actually. The cost of electrolytes is relatively low because zinc and bromine are fairly common. Uh, the electrolytes uh, allow deep discharge. Uh, the cycle life is expected to be very long. Essentially, these things can be cycled again and again uh, indefinitely. And of course, because it's an aqueous electrolyte, uh, the system is non-flammable. And uh, the electrolyte is also environmentally benign. The uh, amount of bromine in solution is, uh, is uh, relatively little. You could dip your hand into the solution and not worry about it. So uh, the Primus Power project uh, is, an, is a stimulus project. And uh, it uh, is gearing up for a 25 megawatt three hour battery plant uh, for Modesto, California. And it is going to provide equivalent flex capacity for a 50 megawatt gas turbine system, which would have cost $73 million. If you do the comparison, you find that the gas turbines, uh, uh, that storage beats the gas turbines on cap costs, on ramps, on CO2, and on area. Now, this system is in preparation, but meanwhile, uh, Primus Power has already deployed some of their energy pods of 250 kilowatt, and one megawatt hour in other places. Uh, notably, there is one project uh, in uh, a marine base near San Diego and another project uh, in Puget Sound together with BPA. And in that system, uh, PNL has done the analysis program uh, to select the most cost-effective site and the scale uh, to optimize the value stream. This is important because uh, when you do this correctly, uh, you come come up with a cost-effective project. And of course, Primus Power uh, technology was developed under ARA funding. Redflow battery uh, has found applications for distributed storage uh, in Australia in a considerable number of locations. And uh, they have also undergone testing at the Sandia Energy Storage System test site. So flow batteries are well on the way towards commercialization and developing market share. Uh, we have two good companies uh, that will present their systems today. And uh, well, they will give you all the details. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Emery. And I think we're going to begin with uh, Primus Power. And uh, the presentation will be by Andrew Marshall, Director of Utility Solutions. Can we get Andrew's slides up, please? Andrew, why don't you go ahead and, and begin, and we'll get your slides up in a minute. Perfect. Uh, yeah, and I, uh, I do have to, to thank Todd and uh, Tisa for inviting us to be part of this. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to you know, share uh, where we are in terms of our product and project development. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Dr. Juk. Uh, I uh, sometimes always have to explain what a flow battery is. I think it's actually getting to be much better understood. But I think the crispness with which uh, Dr. Juk described uh, the, the flow battery uh, will make my job a lot easier here. So uh, much thank you to the, the folks who preceded me on this. So I uh, believe I have control now. Um, so I'm going to do my talk here in three parts. Um, talk a little bit about our op the flow, just in general, uh, the, the category of flow batteries and our market opportunity. I'll talk a little bit about our particular unique solution to this. Again, you, uh, zinc bromine flow batteries are not, uh, not your standard flow battery, so that uh, the decoupling of power and energy 
uh, for a zinc bromine flow battery, you still have a, the ability to optimize, but it's not the complete decoupling that uh, a typical flow battery is. But I'll, I'll tell you some of the advantages, and I'll tell you how we went about designing our system. And then lastly, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what the future holds. It's just one man's view of the future, but uh, um, I just want to give uh, some, some thoughts about how I see the market for flow batteries developing. Uh, first of all, I, I think we're all pretty mu we're all pretty aware of what challenges the grid's facing, and I think these these challenges in particular set the table for storage, and really, really even more so for flexible generation uh, and flexible assets that can support uh, the grid. So, I think we're all familiar with uh, the rapid uptick in renewable penetration on the grid. Uh, a lot of this is driven by the cost out programs of uh, solar and wind that have uh, developed over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, a lot of it we've seen very recently with solar. Um, the other thing that I think is moving, and we've seen it by EPA regulations, is more stringent caps on, on emissions. Uh, and just the challenge in citing different, uh, the current status quo assets on the grid. That could be either uh, new lines or it can even be uh, new coal plants or, or fossil fuel plants. Uh, and then the other thing that's changing is how we use electricity. So uh, new, new demands from EVs, new demands from the continued electrification are also driving changes. And, and current solutions are not solving these, these problems. And this, I think, leaves a big opportunity for energy storage. Again, I, I mentioned it's not only energy storage, but it's really flexible solutions. And there, there are flexible solutions out there today. Uh, gas turbines are getting continually uh, more flexible in terms of their ability to meet, uh, to match demand and load. Um, I've written on this slide sort of what the ideal would be. Uh, again, uh, the ideal solution doesn't always exist, but we're, we're getting closer and closer. Uh, thermal generation certainly gets us close, but there are still gaps that a battery uh, and, and a flow battery can solve uh, just as well or if not better than uh, current thermal generation. So you know, the, the things that I, I think are the most differentiated and most valuable to a customer at the end of the day are the, the footprint and the modular uh, design. So the ability to put these assets, these battery assets, very close to load where, uh, where they can solve many different problems at the same time. Uh, and then also the, having that footprint that's small that can, uh, again, enable this to go in densely populated areas where congestion on the distribution system uh, limits the limits solutions and, and also just uh, hampers reliability. So I think those are the big, the big ones where I think uh, our battery technologies are going to be differentiated versus the standard solutions. I stole this, uh, this next page uh, from uh, Southern California uh, Edison white paper back in 2011, but I think uh, I, I like it because it does a good job of saying, you know, we can break down uh, energy storage by where, actually, um, by where on the grid it's placed and then how long uh, it discharges for. And again, there are, I think we've probably all read the different, uh, the different articles out there, to, uh, the different studies out there on what are the, the key killer apps for energy storage. Uh, I've overlaid those apps on the positioning in space and then also that duration. Uh, I do this because really what I want to get at is that there's really only two solutions out there that are commercial right now. And there are a, a number of solutions that are, coming, uh, that are coming out. But the two solutions we have today are short duration batteries, uh, power batteries, uh, that can solve a lot of the problems on the, of the, on the uh, short with, that require short duration energy output. So those are the lithium ion, lead acid type batteries. Um, you also have the longer duration storage. You have your uh, centralized uh, pumped hydro and case solutions. Again, they also solve important grid problems, but there's a big gap um, and it's, it's really that gap of long duration storage sited close to load, which a lot of the flow battery companies are trying to solve. Uh, a, a number of us are coming up in the ranks. Uh, you know, not a lot of these technologies are fully commercial yet. They're, our first projects are coming out, but there are a lot of opportunities uh, for companies uh, like flow batteries and then other, other chemistries as well that are trying to solve this 
a high, what I'm going to call a hybrid system problem. Um, just quickly going over the uh, the advantages of flow batteries uh, for this these hybrid systems. Uh, I think the the place where we're most differentiated is on the safety side of things. Uh, again, all these flow batteries have aqueous electrolytes and are uh, and as a result are less prone to the uh, the explosions and the fires of the other very energy dense battery chemistries, the uh, the lithium ions, uh, even lead acids of the world. Uh, and, and certainly the sodium sulfurs as well. Um, the other place where I think we're uh, differentiated is in the flexibility of design. And, and Dr. Jip brought this up uh, in his uh, primer on flow batteries, which is the ability to decouple power and energy. So uh, if, you, if you need a, a long energy solution, build bigger tanks, have the same size engine. Uh, if you need a bigger engine, build a bigger engine uh, and have a smaller size tank. So there's a, there's, a, there's a fair amount of flexibility in these systems that gives the, the operator and owner uh, the ability to, to customize them for the solution they're trying to deliver. I tried to buzz through that so that I had an opportunity to talk a, a bit about Primus and then also about what we're doing uh, in, the, in the market as well. So just as a quick introduction, uh, Primus is uh, a five-year-old company. We have had our technology looked at and validated by experts in the field. Um, uh, Sandia has tested our battery cell uh, in the last year. Uh, we're doing a project with Raytheon, um, who will speak uh, next. Uh, we'll be doing that project as a microgrid project in San Diego. Uh, and then uh, uh, the Bosch group uh, has an energy storage group as well. Uh, and we've done a, a, a joint development program with them on battery controls, and they will help us integrate uh, eventually our project at, uh, at Modesto. Uh, our first projects are going on the grid uh, at the end of this year and, and the beginning of next year. So uh, three of those projects are uh, listed here. We have a new one that we just added recently, which is a behind-the-meter uh, storage application with one of our uh, with one of our strategic suppliers. Uh, those three projects uh, span the gamut from a uh, behind-the-meter uh, solution with uh, the Marine Corps uh, with Raytheon to the two utilities that we're working with that Imre mentioned as well, the Modesto Irrigation District and uh, Puget Sound Energy. Uh, we've been an incredibly blessed company. Um, we've uh, won competitive grants. Uh, as Imre said, a lot of the product development that we have done, actually the majority of the product development we have done, has been funded by the generous DOER grant. Uh, we've also uh, pushed our technology forward with uh, funding from RPE. And we're, uh, have it, we've also been able to uh, get some funding from the Bonneville Power Administration and TEC for our demonstration projects. Um, we're also le uh, luckily uh, well funded by our investors. Uh, the one I want to mention out of here, we have four venture investors and then a strategic investor, uh, Anglo-American Platinum, uh, who is both a strategic supplier to us and also an off-taker in the long run. And then lastly, our team uh, is developing. I think uh, we're up to over 55 folks now, uh, doubled in the last year. And we've started to bring on uh, executives with a fair amount of experience in both technology and then energy. So uh, we are certainly gearing up for uh, going, uh, going fully commercial shortly. That path has uh, taken uh, a while. Again, it's a, we're a five-year-old company, but again, uh, with our support from grants, we've been able to push the technology faster than we would have had um, if we hadn't had those grants. Uh, our technology has grown from small-scale systems uh, down in the, uh, the kilowatt size uh, that we've had running in the lab for over two years now. Uh, and we've recently built uh, our first large-scale products. So the energy pod, which you see on the bottom right, is a 40-foot shipping container in which we put 14 uh, individual flow battery cells. Uh, the flow battery cells are what you see maybe in the bottom center. Uh, they're about the size of a refrigerator, with the electrochemical stack being the was the typical freezer part at the top, and then the tank system and uh, pumping system in the bottom, which would be your uh, your typical refrigerator part of the system. Uh, as I mentioned, we have four demonstrations, all of those, uh, and one, actually, sorry, three demonstrations and one commercial sale. Um, that's the Israeli, Israel Chemicals sale for a behind-the-meter uh, deployment of a single energy cell to the managed demand. 
But then we have the three uh, projects that I mentioned on the first slide, the microgrid with Raytheon at Miramar, and then the two utility projects. I will speak more about those uh, coming up. I just want to talk a little bit about our solution. Um, so the solution I like to simply state is a, is a megawatt hour in a 40-foot shipping container. Uh, that megawatt hour can be discharged anywhere from the tens of kilowatts up to 420 kilowatts on the DC side. Um, that's a pretty good range of flexibility for a flow battery. Again, we're typically energy batteries with low C rates, uh, but we get up to almost a C over 2 rate for our, uh, for our discharge, uh, which I think gives our customers a lot of flexibility. Uh, I think the other thing that's unique about our battery is that it's uh, it is modular, mo it's a modular flow battery. So unlike having two tanks, um, which is the typical standard for flow batteries, we have a single tank um, that we are able to, uh, and, and we're able to, to uh, pump specifically from different parts of the tank to emulate the two tank system, but to do it in half the number of parts. I think that's one way we keep the, um, keep the cost and the reliability of our system high. The other thing we've done, if you step all the way back to the left, is uh, taking a different view on the on the, the material design for the, the system. And a lot of this was helped on, again, by the DOE uh, grants and RPE. But we've uh, taken a little bit of a turn from typical flow battery development, uh, which has uh, carbon impregnated plastic electrodes. Um, and we've gone with metal electrodes that allow us to run at higher current densities and also have a more robust product that has a utility grade uh, 20 year life. Um, we have also uh, designed out of our stack failure mechanisms like uh, separators. So we don't actually have a membrane separator in our battery. Again, those fail on the order of five, uh, five years and you'll have to replace a stack or at least replace those expensive membranes. Uh, again, we found clever ways to take that out of the system, increasing our reliability and decreasing our cost. There are obvious uh, trade-offs there on the electrochemical side, but we make those up uh, with, uh, with our electrolyte chemistry. So that, all that sort of packages up uh, the product that I talked about earlier, which is that megawatt hour in a 40-foot shipping container. Uh, here are some of the differences, again, uh, from conventional flow batteries. Uh, all of these help us to deliver a product that's at lower cost, higher reliability, uh, and that is uh, ultimately very modular and can install quickly. Uh, as Imre mentioned, our zinc bromine flow battery has higher redox couple. That allows us to put more power into a smaller area uh, and with less electro, uh, with, ele with fewer electrodes. Um, we have a single tank, uh, which gives us higher reliability. Uh, we've eliminated the separator, which decreased cost and increased reliability over the life. And we've also uh, provided uh, as I discussed, we've, we've um, developed metal electrodes that allow us to discharge at higher current densities, up to 200 uh, milliamps per square centimeter. Again, that allows us to put more power into a small area, uh, giving, a, again, a customer the ability to um, put this battery close to load and in tight situations. Uh, looking back at the, the product, again, the, the things that I want to highlight about the product are, are really the modularity. So that's the 40-foot shipping container, again, uh, with the capacity to discharge up to 420 kilowatts. Inside that, that, uh, that shipping container are 14 flow battery cells. Uh, those flow battery cells themselves are a product, uh, and we are selling those. Um, those uh, individual cells can be discharged up to 30 kilowatts on a DC side for the full duration of the battery, uh, which itself is a 72 kilowatt hour cell. Uh, those cells can be placed in shipping containers or they can be taken out of the shipping container and put in strings that can be put into buildings. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can deploy these batteries, which gives, again, a customer uh, a fair number of opportunities to deploy these in uh, site-specific ways. Again, you're probably not going to want for a, you know, a, potentially in the future, you're not going to want a, uh, a, a 50 megawatt plant with uh, hundreds of 40-foot shipping containers. Uh, you're probably going to want to put that in a, in a building with a, a, a prettier facade. But essentially what I, what I like to think about is you know, this is the future of what power plants could look like. Um, you know, uh, and, and this would 
essentially revolutionized the way that power uh, power plants are 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 thought about uh, in the field. So. I want to not take up uh, too much time talking about the product, but I also want to talk about the unique applications that we're, we're uh, going after as well. So as I mentioned, uh, two of those are behind the meter. Those are the top and bottom projects uh, with uh, Miramar. Uh, at Miramar, we're working with Raytheon as the system integrator to provide a microgrid uh, of our battery, uh, a two, uh, one uh, energy pod, a 250 kilowatt, uh, one megawatt hour system uh, that is mated with uh, solar panels, uh, a, a roughly a similar sized um, output uh, that will be used to, one, manage demand uh, and the demand charges that the base faces, but also at the same time uh, to island uh, several critical loads for up to three days off of just solar and battery. Um, the value to the customer here, um, we've estimated it somewhere around a a 10-year payback, uh, maybe a 9% IRR, depending on um, uh, what your um, uh, depending on what your assumptions are. Uh, I think those assumptions are important because uh, here in the U.S., if you think about uh, the what you're displacing is is diesel, uh, the value is not as great, and the paybacks are not as great. But there are places in the world where uh, diesel is much more expensive, and these paybacks actually look much more attractive uh, for uh, for folks. And that is certainly a, a, a uh, application that we are interested in. Uh, the other behind the meter project is a peer demand charge management project uh, where we're placing our battery at a uh, chemical mixing facility that actually mixes all of the fire retardant that's being uh, that's being used here in the US on the west coast and in Australia. So it's a, it's a critical facility. Uh, we're using it to help them uh, manage demand uh, and keep and, and, and allow the uh, that product to be made cheaper. Um, the, this particular project is, I think, very interesting because we're able to take a customer from one tariff in Southern California, Edison Territory, to another one and save them quite a bit of money and pay back on the investment rather quickly with a, without a financed product. They are actually going to purchase this uh, product outright um, without any financing involved. Uh, the other two projects we're working on are, I think, your standard, I wouldn't say there's really no standard uh, in, in, in batteries yet, but are your are two, I think, key uh, applications on the utility side of the meter. Uh, one is a deferral that Imra mentioned that we've uh, uh, a, a capital deferral project that we're working on with Puget Sound Energy. Uh, in this case, we're putting uh, batteries at a substation uh, in the uh, to shave a peak and to defer the build of uh, of a of a new substation with a new transformer. Uh, this transformer on this island uh, is being overloaded. Uh, the other things this battery will do is eventually play in the market, so providing ancillary services, uh, and also um, eventually will enable an, a, a, the uh, a couple of feeders to be islanded uh, and specifically a couple of warming stations because. On this island, there are quite a few um, quite a few outages, uh, and uh, those happen in the winter. And uh, it's uh, an island where there isn't natural gas, and uh, the the residents do need uh, to stay warm when the when the power is off. Um, the other thing that the uh, that we're doing is our work with Modesto Irrigation District. Uh, we'll be placing a single energy pod on in route to the 25 megawatt uh, letter of intent that Modesto gave us. Uh, to provide essentially its flexible capacity, uh, and we'll be actually setting our first battery at a uh, natural gas generating facility. Um, part of the reason we're doing that is, you know, at one point we thought uh, the natural gas uh, peakers were our enemy, but they're actually in some ways our friend. They uh, they don't like to cycle, um, and in a lot of cases, uh, our having our battery co-sited with one of these uh, systems can help a uh, a utility like Modesto to run those gas assets more effectively to ramp with the battery as opposed to doing that with the uh, the gas generator and to allow them to integrate their 27 percent renewables more effectively uh, than they were doing without the batteries. So what we'll be doing there is uh, first uh, a little bit of a try before you buy with Modesto. Um, we hope that uh, is on path to the 25 megawatts that uh, Modesto has, again, stated their intent for. Um, and 
uh, we're very excited about all of these projects and think they're all on path to real applications for us in the future. Lastly, I will take a couple of minutes here just to go over what I think some of the the U.S. market and uh, the U.S. market looks like and potentially what, uh, what you could see coming out of the long duration flow batteries in the, uh, in the, the near, mid, and long term horizons. Uh, again, a lot of the projects that you see now are demonstration scaled on the sub five megawatt size. Uh, a lot of these require us to build uh, our reputation in the industry and then also uh, our strategic partners to support this. You see uh, most of these, like I said, most of the flow battery companies are smaller companies. We're not going to do the whole project. We're going to be a key component of the project, but we're going to need uh, partners uh, like the Raytheons of the world to help us to integrate these projects. And a lot of this early work will help us to build our ecosystems. I think in the midterm, you're going to start seeing uh, flow batteries being used likely on the higher value applications. I can see us going into the microgrids, the, uh, in the distribution system to manage high penetration solar, and then also playing a role in t and deferral and reliability. Those projects can be anywhere from the, you know, again, still single megawatt size up to 10 megawatts, um, and are really dependent on, you know, finding those niche applications where the, uh, the value is high that can, that can support you know, for a developing company and developing, um, uh, developing technology, a, a, a higher cost at the beginning. The long term, and I think this is where, uh, where we all see the industry going, is toward the local capacity type applications, the large peaker replacement type applications for these, these systems. And these systems can be anywhere from the tens to up to 50 megawatts uh, of size. Again, this will be driven a lot by um, our ability to take the cost out, which I haven't put here, but there will also be um, you know, the requirements to meet the RPS targets and, and the needs for those flexible capacity, for the, our flexible capacity. Um, certainly there are showstoppers that could stop all of this, but um, I think in general uh, the, the biggest thing that would hamper us uh, as, a, as an industry or a, a segment of an industry, namely the flow batteries, is is really our execution on being able to take the cost out of these systems and operate them effectively uh, early on. So uh, with that, I think I'm going to stop and um, hand over to, uh, to the next speaker. Thank you for your time. OK, thank you very much. Uh, before we go on to uh, the next presentation there, we, we have received a bunch of questions, and uh, a couple of them are specific to Andrew's presentation, so I want to go ahead and give him a chance to respond to those uh, before we go on. So one is on, on your slide number 15, if we can get that up on the screen, how are you defining payback period? So payback period, this is simple payback. So uh, assuming a capital investment in year zero, how many years it takes to pay off that capital investment. So that is, and that's an all-in system. That's not buying a DC battery, that's buying a fully installed system. Okay, great. Uh, another question specific to your presentation, how many individual cells per half a megawatt? So for half a megawatt, um, so we can discharge 14 cells up to 420. So you'd have to add in another uh, and that's DC, so I'll do the math for AC. You're probably going to have to provide a string of around uh, 18 cells, and we can do that. We have a very flexible DC preconditioning system, which allows us to string together cells uh, up to around that 18 level. Um, where we get start getting limited is on what our DC bus voltage would be, but uh, we think we can operate somewhere around 18 cells in series uh, to provide a uh, you know, uh, a max discharge of around uh, a little bit over 500 kilowatts uh, for an AC discharge. That would be a two-hour battery, not a four-hour battery, but um, if you wanted a four-hour battery, you'd need uh, two, two strings of about 14 cells. Okay, and then we have a, a question on, on installed cost. What's the present typical installed cost for a five to 10 kilowatt capacity system and what's the target mature commercial product cost? 
Uh, so on the 5 to 10 kilowatts, we um, currently are not providing a system of that size. Um, but I can give you just rough, um, rough estimates on where we, we want to be for systems of larger size, fully installed. Uh, we have designed our company around um, the, um, the price that we believe will be in the market for flexible capacity uh, of a four-hour duration. And we think that batteries fully installed uh, at $500 a kilowatt hour of capital cost will be what wins in that, uh, in that segment of the market. And that's what we built our company for and what we built our cost structure for the, uh, the DC side of that battery for. So um, hopefully that answers, doesn't answer directly the smaller system question because we're not going after that market, but hopefully gives an idea of where we want to be for the larger scale systems. Full, again, a fully installed cost, um, you know, AC power delivered to a, um, to a medium voltage transformer. Okay, so just to just to clarify that, so the so the estimated costs for a commercial system per kilowatt hour, uh, at what kilowatt rating? What's the what's your estimate for that? Yeah, so that's the that megawatt hour in a forty foot container um, installed at five hundred dollars a kilowatt hour, um, and that system would be four times as expensive on a dollar per kilowatt basis because we discharge nominally for a four hour duration at 250 kilowatts. So uh, about $2 a watt, $2,000 a kilowatt for the power, on the power side. Okay, great. I think we, we're going to go ahead uh, on to the next presentation. We do have more questions for Primus, but some of them will apply, uh, you know, also to the uh, Raytheon system and we could ask uh, both presenters to respond to them so uh, let's let's go ahead and um, and go on with the Raytheon presentation and that will be with Tracy Montoya Tracy hello uh, thank you guys for the invitation uh, Todd dr. Zhuk uh, Samantha and Dan and Andrew thanks for a very interesting presentation um, I would like to introduce you to our energy storage solutions uh, that we've been developing here at Raytheon K-Tech uh, here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So uh, we have energy storage devices here in Albuquerque. Uh, Raytheon is a key innovator in many technological areas, including defense and homeland security, as well as civil markets. Uh, in addition, Raytheon provides specialized electronics, as well as mission support systems and integration to a number of customers worldwide. Our division here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, reports to Raytheon Missile Systems, um, and they provide advanced engineering and integration in missile defense, as well as power and energy solutions for a broad range of customers. And because of our numerous programs and expertise in Raytheon, Raytheon offers uh, based here, our engineering and advanced control system skill set, the en energy storage group has emerged. Um, as our work looks for other means of energy to reduce fossil fuels and emissions, energy storage becomes a key enabler for intelligent power and energy management and smart grid capabilities. In fact, energy storage systems have the potential to drastically reduce the amount of fuel used at remote sites, not only reducing fuel costs, but also the logistics associated with the transportation of fuel. Uh, the U.S. military, for example, has set mission level goals to decrease its dependence on fossil fuels and better manage its fuel demand and usage. Um, this can save lives, combat, reduce costs through its operations. So currently, 80% of the of the fuel at base camps is used by generators. Uh, because convoy routes are hazardous and transport is expensive, alternative means of energy is a more viable option. Uh, the use of these fuels for generators is also inefficient. Almost half of the time, generators have a load of 25% or less. To gain the most bang for your buck, generators should be ran at like 75 to 80% or better. Um, microgrid. Management has improved also by allowing multiple storage units to be placed in microgrid systems based on load needs. 
In addition, renewables can be used effectively and efficiently with energy storage by providing load power, charging the energy storage systems, or sending back to the grid energy that they need. Uh, here at Raytheon, k -Tech, we have developed two baseline units, uh, the RK-10 and the RK-30. Each of these systems have proven to be safe and reliable uh, and flexible for smart grid technology. The RK-30 is a 30 kilowatt, 120 kilowatt hour, uh, 208 three-phase system. And the RK-10 is a 5 kilowatt, 30 kilowatt hour, 240 volt system, single phase. Uh, both of these systems use flow battery technology with robust state-of-the-art inverters that meet both the battery and the field specifications. Our systems are extremely versatile, offering off-grid, grid, and microgrid capabilities. The systems can be directly integrated with generators, renewables. Uh, they can optimally manage and control energy efficiently um, with our controls and distributed power. And there are numerous benefits across various environments, from forward operating bases to microgrids, uh, to fix spaces and commercial sites such as telecommunication. So if you look at the picture here on the next slide, um, to the top left, that's our RK-10 system. And it has access on both sides of the cabinet with a simple breaker connection that's set to the side so that you can connect to grid, uh, generator renewables load. Um, there are two batteries in the system that are housed in the lower portion, separated from our controls and electronics that are housed on the upper portion. Uh, the picture on the bottom left is also an RK-10, but it's in modular form set that we're working on. Uh, the unit is actually three separate pieces, uh, with the center piece being the controls and electronics and the two batteries on the side pieces. It's detachable and can be used for multiple places where it's hard to get to, like rooftops and get into elevators, etc. Uh, the figure to the right is our RK-30 system. And that system consists of 12 batteries that can be loaded and unloaded easily with the tray assemblies uh, from the front and back. We also have door access on front and back. Uh, the controls and electronics are housed to the right. And the power to the system is provided on the side of the panel. Uh, so you don't have to get into the unit to connect. Uh, the RK-30 uh, can replace the standard 30 kilowatt generator. Uh, both the RK-10 and the RK-30 use a commercially available zinc bromine battery which can be scaled to meet specific power and energy needs. And in addition, with our modular design, the units are easily scaled to meet customer needs. Um, general specifications for both the RK-10 and the RK-30 is that they easily integrate with various power sources, including PV, wind, generators, and the grid, and can support numerous applications. They can be connected to the grid or in a microgrid configuration. And their temperature range is, is large, minus 10 to 50 degrees C. The flow batteries we are using have a long life and currently over uh, 1,200 cycles. The control systems we are using are reliable and control and monitor temperatures, voltages, currents, and battery cycling. Uh, and also the inverters we use are grid capable and have IEEE 1547 and UL 1745 compliance. And all the enclosures that we use are NEMA 4 rated. Uh, the RK30 unit housed in a Tricon uh, supplies 30 kilowatts of power with 120 kilowatt hour capacity. And the unit, as I said before, is 208 volts, three phase, 60 hertz. And the unit has also met TRL6 specs. Uh, the RK10 unit meets the needs of typical telecommunication sites. And so it's a single phase 240 unit, uh, 10 kilowatt hour power, or 20 kilowatt hours of power, 10 kilowatt peak. Um, the RK-10 also operates off-grid and in islanded mode. And the RK-10 is available in both standard and standalone versions. We're using commercially available zinc bromine flow batteries from Red Flow. Um, they're great batteries that support 5 and 10 kilowatt capacities. This allows scalability to support customer-specific power and energy needs. Uh, the flow batteries can handle charging up to 100% of its capacity, as well as partial discharge without any degradation. The batteries also allow partial recharge for applications that fluctuate in power. The batteries are sealed and are 100% recyclable. Uh, they operate at minus 10 to 50, significantly better than other technologies such as lead acid. 
Uh, the zinc bromine is fully discharged during storage and shipment, so it has zero volts on the terminal, so there's, there's no um, damage or anything can happen on shipment. Other battery chemistries can be discharged to zero volts, however, doing so can be inefficient and degrade life, as in the case with lead acid, or become more volatile in the case of lithium ion. Uh, the transition from off-grid to on-grid provides uninterrupted power for remote locations where power is not always consistent, or for disaster recovery, or critical operations where power may be down, or power need, is needed for specific applications. Uh, the RK system control architecture embeds a number of advanced algorithms that perform multiple applications, including load following, peak shaving, backup, firming, ramp control, and time shifting. The versatility of the RK systems with turnkey integrations with renewables, generators, and smart grids allow the customer the opportunity to use peripherals that make sense for their site. The two pictorials to the right uh, capture the essence of our modular and standalone designs. Uh, the one at the top is a pictorial with three of the standalone units, and the one below is our modular unit with a generator. Our versatile plug-and-play energy storage solutions with configurable control systems are able to support numerous applications for on or off grid environments. The RK systems are scalable to up to 100 kilowatts to meet customer needs for high power and increased energy. And they also, in addition, can be used for fossil fuels to significantly reduce generator runtime. And it can also optimize solar and energy. Uh, because the battery technology we are using enables partial charge and discharge cycles, we are able to load, follow as needed, and therefore we're able to reduce the generator usage. Our control system has multiple configurations that support load following, peak shaving, renewable, firming, and time shifting, and uh, backup where we're, we can partially or fully, uh, we can have partial or full capacity as allocated by uh, the user. Uh, we also do monitoring controls so that we can get alerts on system status and health. Uh, we have a web-based interface that we can use to both check status and also perform maintenance and tests. And we have easily downloadable uh, log data that we can have access to uh, both on short-term and long-term via the web interface. Uh, the zinc bromine has advantages over lead acid. Uh, this is our the batteries that we're using from Redflow. Uh, they have 100% capacity util utilization, 50% uh, of the weight of the lead acid at equal energy densities. As I said before, we can do full or partial power, which is great for uh, different applications. We have increased number of cycles. Um, they're continuing to increase the number of cycles that they have on the batteries with the technology. Uh, they have greater energy density. They can be stored and transported in the discharge state, and overall, they're just an environmentally safer battery. Uh, energy storage addresses numerous challenges as well uh, for forwarding operating bases, microgrids, and remote sites. Uh, for forwarding operating bases, we're namely looking at fuel consumption, reducing fuel consumption. Uh, for microgrids, we have a secure, reliable power, uh, so we can use this to form a microgrid for local communities. Uh, like, for example, if there's a disaster re recovery, we can put a response team together um, that can be on a local microgrid. And for unstable grids and remote sites, uh, this is a great solution. Uh, we have applications with the military uh, where we can support various theater, theaters of operation, including mobile, tactical, and forward operating bases. Uh, we can improve logistics by keeping the, uh, the transportation of fuel down. Uh, we enhance energy efficiency, uh, generator utilization, and significantly reduce the consumption.
So we also have energy storage applicable for microgrid operations. Um, for, we're reliable. We can use it for communications and to compile um, grid capability for security-based natural disasters. We can enable a microgrid, as I discussed before, for fire or police. Um, our efficiency for transmission and, and distribution systems. Uh, we have sustainability. It's easily integrated with renewables. And uh, we can ma maintain quality by consistently charging and discharging cycles without degradation of the battery. So on, our tele on the, the RK10 that we're using for telecommunication sites, um, the US telecommunication annually, annually energy demand is about 20 gigawatts. Um, most are grid connected, but off-grid sites are the fastest growing segments of, of new installations. Uh, PV, PV is increasingly powering telecommunication sites, but they are looking for other potential markets like our energy storage system. Uh, the potential market demand for the U.S. telecommunication industry is 25 to 40,000 energy storage units per year. Uh, customers are looking for an extended backup capability of greater than 48 hours. So how do we address this? By providing a green, safe, reliable energy storage solution. So in comparison to other similar technology, uh, like the lead acid, uh, there are a number of differentiators. In current systems, uh, lead acids require heavy cooling. Um, the red flow, zinc bromine batteries are happy to be at high temperatures and require less cooling. Uh, with remote <coughs> sites, we are able to save dollars because we can do remote uh, access for maintenance. We can also continue to, uh, storage with a battery that requires maintenance through this remote, remote site. So in all, we are a greener solution compared to lead acid technologies. And that's all I have. Thank you. OK, and thank you very much. Uh, we have a, uh, a number of very good questions, and uh, some of them will be for one particular presenter, or some will be for both. And I also want to invite uh, Dan Borneo and Emery Shook to chime in at any time if you have a question or comment as well. Uh, so <clears throat> here's uh, one question for, uh, for Raytheon in particular. What is the maximum charging current for the RK10? I believe it's about 30 amps. Okay, and the and somebody also wants to know the total container weight of each RK10 and RK30 unit. I, I think it's about 5,000 for the RK10, and I think the larger unit was 13,000 pounds. Okay. And how long are the ba are the batteries um, good for? In other words, duration, I guess, and and then lifespan. Uh, so the lifespan depends on how often you cycle it. So it's it's a twelve hundred or more cycle battery right now. So full cycle battery. So if you did partial cycles, it would go well into three plus years uh, if you full, if you did cycles daily. Tracy, this is uh, Dan Borneo. Okay. Uh, this is Dan Borneo. How long would it take to go? How long does it take your system to go from charge to discharge? So it usually takes on the RK10 system that we've been testing out at Sandia. It takes about four hours for a charge, uh, full cycle charge, and then uh, about three hours for a, a discharge, full cycle. Okay. So that was my next question, but um, let me rephrase that question. So when you're when you're if you talked about um, a UPS application, so if if your 
charging and something happens and you need to go to discharge to back up a load, how, how fast can it make that transition? Uh, it's within 30, 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, also for, for Raytheon, someone wants to know whether your energy uh, storage telecom solution is available uh, just in the U.S. or also in other locations around the globe. It's available both um, internationally as well as domestically. Okay, great. So I think, uh, you know, we have a few questions here that I'd like to, to put to both presenters. Uh, first, what, what's the turnaround efficiency for fully charged and partially charged batteries? If you could, you could both address that. Can I uh, ask a clarifying question? Um, <laughs> the question was a was a turn turnaround efficiency. Sorry, um, what is? Yeah, um, that's that's correct. Okay. So I, I so I'll take it. Uh, I'll take the first part. So. Um, certainly, the the biggest uh, for us the the biggest impact on efficiency is what power you're charging or discharging at. Certainly, there's um, uh, using your top end range. So I mentioned for us that range on a cell is around 30 kilowatts. Um, using our top end range will have a lower round trip efficiency than when we're operating in the uh, sort of sweet spot for the battery, but uh, there aren't a lot of batteries that have that top end that we have um, in terms of its uh, its flexibility. Uh, so for normal operation inside the uh, typical nominal power ratings, uh, this is in the sort of 10 to 20 kilowatt range for our individual cells, um, the round trip efficiency is around 70 percent uh, for the stack. And then if you were to discharge the higher powers, it's somewhere, you probably take off about five points. We've seen anywhere between 63 and 65% for the very, very high power discharges. And we've got, those have been validated by uh, our work with uh, Sandia. So on the Raytheon system, the, do DC, I have a the DC efficiency runs 78 to 80%. The system efficiency, as Andrew just mentioned, does vary based upon um, your application and how you're running the particular system. Um, so that would range in the you know 60 to 68 percent range. That's at the AC side. Okay, thank you. Dan, did you want to jump in with something? Yeah, I have a question for Andrew. So after a four-hour uh, discharge, Andrew, how long would it take to recharge your system to 100%? Yeah, Assuming so um, there's a couple things you would do. You'd normally do, um, uh, it depends on if you want, sorry, actually, sorry, it depends on if you'd want to do uh, what we call a stripping cycle. Those will take roughly half an hour for us. Um, so it'd be half an hour uh, plus... Uh, the recharge time for a four-hour system right now is somewhere around eight hours. So you can do a full discharge charge cycle in uh, 12 hours. So you can run two full cycles a day. So um, full four-hour discharge cycles. Sorry. How um, how often do you have to strip after each after each um, discharge, or can you go an extended period of time? So we are exploring the range uh, with what we can do right now. Um, we think, with what we've seen early on, that we will be able. We will only be required to strip on the order of once uh, every week. Um, so we won't have to do it after every cycle. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, we have a question here for the Raytheon folks that I think we, we already asked earlier for, for Primus Power, and that is, what's the installed cost of the Raytheon systems in dollars per kilowatt hour? Well, given there's a lot of variables in that question alone, we'd be happy to talk about pricing offline if you give us a call directly. Okay. Um, 
is the do, for both companies do you have a design installation and commissioning uh, guideline uh, product or some kind of uh, materials for customers I'll start I'll start with Primus so um, our first systems will go out in the field in the first quarter of next year and second quarter we are in the process and actually working with some of the folks from Sandy and, and uh, Pacific Northwest National Labs and our customers on developing our uh, install commissioning factory tests and site test plans uh, so while they will not be ready today, they'll be ready shortly, certainly. And we'll improve them as we uh, put more systems in the field. OK, on the RK end, we do have manuals for installation, transport, and use of the system itself. OK, great. Uh, I have a question for both of you on uh, PCS. Can you, can you Discuss a little bit what, what PCS comes with the units and what would be a middleware product. Is the P PCS built in? So I'll go first. So the, the Primus system uh, that I've been showing, uh, that I showed at least in here, is, uh, is a DC battery. We, uh, that is our standard product offering. We can offer uh, an integrated PCS, uh, power conditioning system, uh, with an inverter and the required uh, DC AC breakers, uh, and uh, a, we already offer a battery management system that will be included with the DC package. Uh, but we are, we like we like to say, um, <laughs> as many developers like to say, we're they're uh, battery agnostic. We're inverter agnostic on our end. Uh, we've designed, I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier. A, uh, a DC preconditioning uh, system that allows us to output uh, very specific uh, constant DC voltages for charge and discharge. Uh, they, we have buck boost converters uh, as standard options uh, as part of our, our DC product. Uh, that allows us to interface with any number of power conditioning systems uh, out there. For our demos, we're going to be using Parker Hannafin inverters, but there are a number of different uh, inverter types that we're in the process of qualifying and working with. So on the RK systems, uh, we basically have an AC interface on, on those systems and we use high-end breakers and we have a inverters that meet compliant with IEEE and, and UL standards. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, I, uh, this is just uh, something I've been thinking as, we, as we've gone along here. Uh, there's been some uh, discussion in the presentations about microgrids, and we're seeing a lot of interest uh, in microgrids for, for resilient power solutions uh, in a number of states. And I'm, I'm just curious uh, if you could each speak a little more toward, um, you know, what are the, the benefits and or uh, challenges of, of flow batteries in in microgrids, and you know, do, for each of your systems, um, you know, do you have any any um, data or or uh, you know, can you speak to any of your uh, demonstration projects that are that are in a microgrid context? And, you know, well, let's go with um, Primus, and then Raytheon will just continue that order. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question, and we certainly see the microgrid market being very important, uh, not only from the customer point of view for resiliency, but also on the grid, uh, on the utility side of the uh, uh, utility side of the uh, world as well. So, um, in terms of our performance of a the performance of a flow battery in a microgrid, this is a this is a great question because I think it's still, um, I think there are uh, lots of people. Um, there aren't a lot of people out in the world who actually know uh, a ton. And actually, um, I will um, admit that I'm probably not going to be the most educated on this. Maybe, our, maybe my uh, colleagues from, from Raytheon might, uh, might uh, be able to speak to this more intelligently than I. But you know, as I look at the microgrid space, you can definitely put 
just about any type of battery in that grid. It's the same thing as the macro grid. The question is what you want to use that battery for. If you're going to be doing uh, you know, shifting of large amounts of energy and you're going to be using the battery, cycling it every day, you certainly want a battery like a flow battery um, that has deep discharge capabilities uh, and long lifetime, long service lifetime as a result. Um, so that's, you know, uh, however, if you're just using your microgrid for short periods of time, if you're just, if you want instantaneous pickup of, uh, of drop load, you're probably going to pick a different battery for that particular solution. So, um, you know, hopefully that gives a little bit of a, a, a start starting framework, and maybe my uh, maybe the co-presenters from from Raytown can give uh, some more detail. Uh, I apologize that I can't. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity for flow batteries in the microgrid market. Um, it's still an emerging market, if you will, with respect to standards in that market for the microgrid controller. Um, for example, the the battery system that Andrew will be developing and delivering for the Miramar project is using a microgrid controller developed by Raytheon. Um, so, you know, there are standards still developing with respect to how to integrate the components on the microgrid. Flow batteries give you a lot of options for the types of applications that you can support on that microgrid. And as Andrew pointed out, different types of battery technologies could accomplish different needs for that microgrid. You know, lithium for a power spike type need on the microgrid versus the flow batteries where you need multiple hours of support and the ability to operate in a partial state of charge or discharge. So when um, you're doing uh, peak shifting or, uh, or moving around big amounts of energy, flow batteries definitely are a good, uh, a good technology. Uh, however, on a microgrid, you also have uh, occasions where you need to shift back and forth quickly. And the possibility arises for doing a hybrid system, where you're using lithium ion or, or lead acid uh, to do the immediate response and then back it up with a long-range energy response from the flow batteries. So a uh, question, uh, Sherry and, and uh, Andrew, we talk about cycles, four hours, two hours, but how, how does your system operate? How does it like it when it's going maybe not, not fast, like frequency regulation, but maybe somewhere partial discharge to 25, 50 percent? Uh, and then recharging. Does your systems like that type of application? Yeah, from the Raytheon perspective, that's an ideal application for the Red Flow battery. It does operate within the 100% utilization of its capacity range, so you can have a full depth of discharge, but switching back from charging and discharging is kind of the ideal energy application for this system. <coughs> no, no, one thing is, um, Sherry, you said Thir or, uh, um, Tracy said 30 seconds between charge and discharge. Is, is that is that correct? Because if you're using a UPS, maybe maybe the UPS application would be assuming that it was fully charged and sitting there in standby, that it would be a lot faster. Or what is the time? Oh, okay, so no. What I, what I thought you were asking, Dan, was if it went off grid. I thought you meant if you went into UPS mode, how long would it take for it to transition, but it goes, it, it's less than second for it to transition from charge to discharge. So, yeah, okay. in an islanded mode, if it's becoming the frequency generator in an islanded mode, that's where it can take up to 30 seconds. Yeah, and I, I, was, I wasn't going to pitch in earlier, but I, was, I, I thought that 30 seconds sounded a little long. I mean, we've done yeah. tests yeah. Um, with Raytheon sending signals from their uh, you know, their, com their controller in, um, in uh, Boston out to the Primus system and have it turn on, turn off, uh, and switch to from charge to discharge in sub-second time. So uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad we clarified that, cause, uh, but I didn't want to step on any toes either. <laughs> yeah, we've actually, Andrew just sidelined, we've, we've been um, working a little with IDS to help test the microgrid controller with our existing system, which has some similar, you know, functionality on a smaller scale, if you will, to what you'll be putting out there. So, so, so do, have you guys ever tested your systems to the, uh, if we are talking about a UPS application, have you tested your system to the, the, the Sabima curve? And, and I might be outdated on the name of the curve anymore, but it's basically how fast a UPS needs to respond 
to, to uh, ensure proper operation or continuing operation of electronic devices? So we know that Redflow has done a significant amount of testing in that area on the battery itself. And we can pull those reports and have those published as part of the response to this webinar. Yeah, and I'll just add on from the, from the Primus side, uh, we don't intend our battery to do the instantaneous pickup that I think we're, you're talking about for the um, uh, for for UPS support. We we offer as an option uh, the the ability to do that time of work, but we're going to put in um, a different type of battery in the in the uh, in our container to do that. Again, it's a, it's an optional part of our battery, but it would be a an essentially a hybrid system with a fast reacting either lithium ion or lead acid battery to do the load pickup um, and then allow our battery to kick in and do the, the ride through. So um, you know, our battery wouldn't be doing, our flow battery wouldn't be doing the, the, uh, the instantaneous pickup. It would be a faster reacting. Uh, in addition, Dan, you're probably aware that Dave has been doing the PNNL protocol as well as some additional response time testing with the RK10 out in mm -hmm. Sandia. So that stand report will have additional you know, independent testing data here very soon. Okay, and that so just for the audience, uh, that will be published on the Sandia.gov website. Okay, so um, as we we moved into a sort of a free form discussion here, a couple of uh, listeners are trying to find out, uh, you know, how to how to reach people for more information. I'm wondering if we could get, uh, Samantha, if we can get um, contact information for the presenters on the screen at some point uh, sure. over the next next few minutes. Um, somebody wants to know who Sherry is because her name doesn't actually appear here at Sherry Nevins. She's um, with Raytheon as well as Tracy Montoya. They're both, both here from Raytheon. So uh, another question uh, for both uh, organizations, I think, is what are the maintenance requirements of these systems and and especially any distinctive maintenance requirements? So from the RK system, essentially the only thing that needs to be maintained is uh, batteries and we're looking, working with Redflow to, to figure out maybe how to do that, uh, not only replace the battery but maybe just replace the stack. Uh, from an ongoing maintenance, Andrew mentioned earlier in the presentation about the stripping, and that is a maintenance cycle typical for the zinc bromine battery. That's done typically on about a weekly basis, depending on the usage of the system. Um, overall, from a, a system maintenance perspective, when we get out in the out years, five plus and so forth, uh, from a battery maintenance perspective, it would be a stack replacement, not a full battery replacement. And that would be the component that would um, you know, essentially wear out with use. So you're assuming that your um, your electrolyte's good for what twenty years? Yes. Yeah, and I'll uh, I'll 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 pitch in on this one. Um, so for us, um, we the one difference we have is we we designed a a, a metal electrode stack uh, using the sim electrolytes that are very uh, sorry electrode materials that are very similar to what's used in the chloro alkyl industry for turning. Um, brines into chlorine uh, for, for bleach. Um, so what, uh, and those electrodes in those systems are, you know, really, uh, really pressure, uh, pressurized, pressure tested uh, with under and over potentials, and they last for 10 to 15 years. Uh, we're not going to treat ours like that, so we believe that our stacks will last on the order of 20 years uh, and have a, um, uh, have a useful life of 20 years. So you wouldn't be replacing that. Well, you'll be re replacing on our systems, um, depending on how you cycle them. Um, you know, pumps uh, will need to be replaced depending on the duty cycle for the pump and what you're doing for the battery. But again, it's hard for me to know exactly without knowing what the, the duty cycle and use case is um, to, to predict when you would need to replace a pump. Uh, for our electrolyte, uh, we add in a number of small organic compounds in there to support, uh, we're a plating battery, it supports plating and a, a very fine layer of zinc. Um, 
those uh, will decay over time and it'll have to be replaced, but it's not a full electrolyte uh, replacement. It's a, uh, a small, uh, it's a small addition, uh, usually a cartridge that we can add onto the, the battery to, it's not really replace the electrolyte, but replenish some of the, uh, the performance agents inside the, inside the electrolyte. Uh, the other things that are standard are uh, how you care for um, the pipes and, and checking seals and things like that, but those, to our knowledge, uh, we've designed them again for a 20-year life, but again, you'll, you'll want to look at those every, every time you go out to inspect the battery, which we believe will be on a quarterly basis, um, and you may, may have uh, yearly replacements of, of some of those uh, components. The other thing is there's certainly a lot of monitoring that we have in here, uh, pH meters, things like that. Uh, those will have to be replaced on a pretty regular basis, um, but again, are not um, intensely expensive items. So, so do you, when you're talking about uh, replenishing, do you have any, like, hydrogen outgassing? So we um, we want to recombinate our uh, our hydrogen. So hydrogen offgassing is is very low, uh, if if uh, if any at all. Uh, so zero in our system. Uh, same here. So the hydrogen is minimal. They've, we've done multiple tests with Redflow, and and we found through our RK30 system that it was basically zero. Okay, I I, I want to. Um move to a question that uh, goes more to the business model and ownership model for these systems because I you know I think we can uh, there's a there's a lot of questions of you know having to do with maintenance and, and technical specifications but but for your markets uh, it's very important for people to understand this this um, aspect as well question is have either of the vendors explored service models where they own and maintain the equipment and sell the power energy, ancillary services, et cetera. So this would be, I guess, more of a, a third party or a kind of a lease model. Is that something that, that either of you are, are looking at and um, can you speak to your uh, existing and projected business models? So we have actually looked at that particular scenario um, and have talked with a couple of companies. Um, one. Uh, conversation has gone a lot further, if you will, from a business relationship perspective, where we would actually sell systems that they would then be the essentially the utility provider, providing the power and energy to the customer base, as well as servicing the systems. Yeah, and for for Primus, um, you know, we we see ourselves downstream, uh, sorry, upstream in the value chain. So we ourselves uh, don't intend on providing those battery service type contract models uh, and owning systems. That's just not really our bread and butter. Uh, but we certainly uh, intend to have that be one of the uses of our battery. So what we have to do on our end is provide, you know, the surety and performance guarantees that allow a, you know, a developer or owner operator of a system to be able to provide those uh, to, essentially to be bankable and to provide those, uh, those battery service contracts. We certainly do see that as a way the market's going, uh, and we want ourselves to be ready to, um, to be able to be a, a solution that is provided that way. Great. Well, you actually brought up a term that appears uh, from another questioner here, which is, are the systems considered bankable? So, I mean, if each of you could just address that and sort of explain what that means, I think that would be very helpful. Can the questioner clarify what they're asking for there? Um, they, they could if they wanted to write in a, a, an additional clarification. It uh, sounded like uh, Andrew referred to bankability a minute ago, so I was assuming that that was something that he, he understood. You, Andrew, can you speak to that? Yeah, I was, uh, I was just, I always want to pause to see who's going to answer that, that question first. Um, so in terms of, uh, in terms of bankability, that, I mean, that's essentially our, uh, our, as a technology provider, it's, it's the ability for a bank to be able to um, you know, provide a loan for one of, these, one of these systems and the guarantee of performance over time. 
right, uh, and to loan money against one of those guarantees. Um, so, you know, for us to get there, it's a process, right? I think it's uh, got a number of parts. Um, you know, for us, it's finding what we need to guarantee for a particular project, ensuring that uh, we've done the testing to show that we can live up to the guarantee that we've uh, set forth. Uh, that typically requires an independent engineer, a certain number of time amount of operation in the field, uh, lots of testing data that we're collecting as as uh, right now, um, and it's basically a package that uh, you know an, an independent engineer will say, okay, yes, um, yes, Bank A or Bank B, these guys will be able to live up to that commitment that they've uh, that they've said for their performance of their battery. Again, that typically takes a couple of years for a new technology. We are certainly not at this point bankable, um, but we have a pathway to getting there, and we are already starting the process with, you know, the, the key value chain players who can help provide that. So we're working with independent engineers. We're working with essentially reinsurers who can, um, who can back our claims, especially early on, before we have uh, those backed by uh, many years of field experience. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a quick primer on how we look at and think about uh, bankability. Um, I'll let the Raytheon folks add or <laughs> subtract from what I've, what I've said. Yeah, a little bit, little bit different with the startup company with one technology versus a company such as Raytheon with 73,000 employees. But, um, but what we've done to date with respect to deployment of these systems um, is, is established success criteria, and that's part of the system acceptance. Um, so that's where we're at today. Okay. Well, unless there is a further question or comment from Dr. Zhuk or uh, Dan Borneo, uh, I think we need to wrap this up as it's been about our full hour and a half uh, time limit for this webinar. Any final comments from, from Emory or Dan? Well, actually it's very uh, reassuring. Both uh, the fact that companies are beginning to uh, present commercially viable products and also that uh, in the audience we had excellent questions and uh, one gets the picture that people really are interested in the technology and may in future deploy it. So thank you all round. Okay, thank you, Emery. I want so to, I, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, so I just want to add to that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the disinterested third-party observer uh, investigator from Sandia, and you know, the, these float batteries now are starting to, starting to make some inroads into the, into the, um, into the field. So if there's anybody that wants to learn more about them from, from not a specific product but an overall view. Uh, please feel free to email me, and um, see, and I'll be happy to help. Okay, thank you. And we have your email address on the screen right now, as well as mine. We also have the URL for the webinar archive. Uh, throughout this presentation, as usual, I've responded directly to a number of people asking over and over whether this will be available for later viewing, and the answer is yes. Go to that webinar archive address, <coughs> and uh, you can review this as well as all our other webinars. Uh, you can also look at the rest of our website, sign up for our listserv, etc. I want to thank the presenters very much for excellent presentations and also our uh, special guests from DOE and Sandia. And with that, I think we're going to conclude this webinar. <laughs>